issue. Thank you very much. That concludes uh, topical questions. Will general questions, I beg your pardon. Now, before we turn to First Minister's questions, uh, I'm sure members would like to join me in welcoming to our gallery Dr. Gabrielle Andretta, President of the State Parliament of Lower Saxony. Thank you. I'd also like to extend, if I can, a warm welcome to the Scottish Parliament. Sorry, welcome to the Scottish Parliament. Um, my sign language is very rusty. Uh, to many members of the deaf community, uh, BSL users and signers who are present in our gallery today. Uh, I'm sure members will be pleased to hear that for the next six months, we're going to be providing a signed translation of FMQs. Uh, which uh, will be available and then we'll reveal the, uh, review that after the summer. Uh, and I'd like to, before we turn to FMQs itself, I'd like to end with one final appeal, and that is to the First Minister, to our party leaders, and to all members who wish to ask a question today. And that is, please, to keep your questions concise. <laughs> yes. yes. And the answers. The First Minister signed her approval. Uh, first question, Jackson Carlow. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I can try, but I can't promise. Um, Presiding Officer, I'd very much like to give the First Minister a further opportunity to explain some of the inconsistencies surrounding the investigation into Alex Salmon. On Tuesday, the First Minister claimed that there is no manual for dealing with situations like the complaints facing Mr. Salmon, except that such a manual does indeed exist. It's the Scottish Government's own complaints process, which she signed off in December 2017. And it makes clear that the First Minister should only become involved when an investigation is complete. Discussing the, discussing the case with the subject of the investigation on five separate occasions is surely getting involved, isn't it? First Minister. Uh, no, it, it is not. Um, I... I, at no stage, uh, intervened in the process. It would have been wholly inappropriate for me to do so. Um, the process procedure that was signed off, as Jackson Carlaw uh, rightly points out, says that I uh, should not have known uh, about the process. That's why the Permanent Secretary did not tell me about uh, the investigation that uh, followed on the complaints. Um, and uh, as First Minister, I had no role in that process, and that is the position, and that is right and proper. Obviously, I, as other leaders here do, have uh, responsibilities as leader of my party, uh, and meetings took place in that capacity. But all along, uh, in every decision I took, uh, I was anxious to and determined to ensure that I did not intervene in a process in which I had no role to play. Jackson Carlo. I'm, I'm sorry, First Minister, but I, I think my grandmother would have given you what, I would have, what she would have called a very old-fashioned look if you'd said that to her. Uh, meeting the subject of a complaint is getting involved in my book, First Minister, and I'm surprised that you don't appreciate that as well. The First Minister said in her statement this week that she did not know what was going on in the investigation. Yet she also told us this, that on April the 2nd, Mr. Salmon detailed to her the nature of the complaints, and that in subsequent meetings, he set out his concerns about the process and the proposals he was making for mediation and arbitration. So she did know because Mr. Salmon told her. How does the First Minister square her claim that she didn't know what was going on with the fact that Mr. Salmon was telling her what was going on. First Minister. I did, I did not know uh, how the Scottish Government uh, was dealing with the complaint. Uh, I did not know how uh, the Scottish Government uh, was intending to deal with the complaint. Um, and I did not make any effort uh, to find out how the Scottish Government was dealing with the complaint or intervene in how the Scottish Government was dealing uh, with the complaint. As Jackson Carlaw has said, uh, Alex Salmond informed me of uh, the investigation at a meeting on the 2nd of April. I was so anxious that I didn't even inadvertently create any impression uh, that I was uh, seeking to intervene, that I, I didn't immediately tell the Permanent Secretary I was aware of the investigation. 
I changed that judgment when Alex Salmond uh, asked to meet with me a second time. Uh, as Jackson Carlaw said, as I set out on Tuesday, uh, Alex Salmond had set out his concerns about the process. It was clear uh, from what he told me then that he was considering a legal challenge. Uh, when he requested a second meeting, I was concerned that could be imminent. So I told the Permanent Secretary then uh, that I knew about the investigation, about the previous meeting, including the reference to potential uh, legal challenge. I, I told her I supported her decision to investigate and I would not seek to intervene in the investigation in any way. I also said I would make it clear to Alex Salmond again that I would not intervene and that's what I did in the second meeting on the 7th of June and I told the Permanent Secretary of all subsequent contact. I did not self Evidently, I did not intervene uh, in the process. You know, it, it seems to me that I am being simultaneously accused uh, of being involved in a conspiracy against Alex Hammond and also of colluding with Alex Hammond. Nothing uh, could be further from the truth in both of those. Neither of those things are true. Uh, since I found out about the investigation, I have tried to do the right thing in a situation which no matter what happened was never going to be easy for me. The most important thing here uh, has always been and continues to be the complaints that were made and the people who made those complaints. Jackson Carlo. First Minister, you're an experienced politician. The obvious, the obvious commonsensical thing to have done after Alex Salmon advised you of the allegation on April the 2nd would have been to decline to meet him or speak with him on four separate occasions. Again on Tuesday, the First Minister said that the five conversations she had with Mr Salmon about this matter were not government meetings. In other words, her position appears to be that a meeting between the First Minister of the government and the former First Minister of the government about a government investigation involving two government employees was not government business. I mean, really, how? So just to be completely clear, will the First Minister confirm if she and the first min former First Minister were the only two people at these meetings, or were other people present? And if so, who were they? First Minister. Uh, at the first meeting, uh, my Chief of Staff was uh, with me. Uh, Mr Salmond uh, was represented. Uh, of course, my Chief of Staff is a special advisor who also has the ability to assist me, to assist me in party matters. Uh, at the other meetings, at the other meetings uh, no one else uh, was present. Look, I accept absolutely, uh, unreservedly, the scrutiny that comes uh, on me. I didn't choose to be uh, in the situation uh, that we are in. Um, and I all Let's along... Let's hear the answers, please. All along, it have been absolutely clear that the most important thing was that I did not intervene in the government process in which I had no role. And the fact that I had no role in the government process is why it wouldn't have been appropriate for the meetings to be government uh, meetings. I have responsibilities as party leader, as other uh, leaders uh, do. Uh, I did not intervene in the process. Self-evidently, I did not intervene in this process uh, because uh, as... Uh, Jackson Carlaw referred to things like mediation and, uh, and arbitration did not take place. Uh, I acted appropriately. I absolutely accept there were others who think I made uh, wrong judgments along the way, and that is absolutely their entitlement. But I made the judgments that I made. I will stand by uh, and defend those judgments, and I will be absolutely adamant that I did not intervene in this process. Uh, I, it would have been entirely inappropriate for me to have done so. Jackson Carlaw. So, presiding officer, a Scottish government special advisor who is an employee of the government was present at the meetings which we are told were not government meetings. <laughs> presiding officer, this whole sorry business simply doesn't stack up. At the heart of it are two women whose complaint has been entirely botched by this government. We have the former first minister claiming incredibly that there is a political plot led by this government to destroy his reputation. Incredible. And we all have, all we have to show for it is a bill estimated to be at least £500,000, which the taxpayer will now be left to settle. And if the government won't explain convincingly what has happened, and the First Minister, frankly, today hasn't, then I and others believe Parliament should be given the authority to do so. 
Will the First Minister agree today that her officials and ministers will provide evidence on this matter? Because the public deserve to know. First Minister. Well, firstly, as, as all members know, it is entirely for Parliament, rightly and properly for Parliament, to decide what it wants to uh, look into and inquire into. And ministers uh, and government officials uh, will, as they do in all uh, inquiries, cooperate fully uh, with that. I mean, Jackson Callow puts his kind of finger on a point I made earlier. I am right now simultaneously uh, being accused of being engaged in a political conspiracy against Alex Salmond, and I'm also being accused of colluding with Alex Salmond. Neither of those things are true. Uh, the fact of the matter is complaints came forward. Uh, the Permanent Secretary was right to investigate those. Jackson, where I absolutely agree with Jackson Carlow is that is the most important thing here, uh, that people brought forward complaints and it is right that those complaints are investigated. Uh, the question of whether behaviour is criminal is a matter uh, for the police and that's not for me to comment. It was for the Scottish Government to investigate whether the behaviour was inappropriate and the Scottish Government didn't get that right and that is what in all of this I deeply regret and that's why I am also determined that the government will learn lessons uh, from that and if Parliament wants to be part uh, of that process then I uh, certainly would welcome that. Question number two, Richard Leonard. Uh, Presiding officer, I hope that um, all of us in this chamber, all of us in this chamber remember that at the centre of this week's court case are two courageous women who put their faith in a system that has badly let them down. And we owe a duty of care to them and they have a right of access to justice. Labour backs a parliamentary inquiry because serious questions do need to be answered. Questions like the First Minister's five conversations with Alex Salmond. The First Minister has already said that she does not consider these to be government meetings, even though these were meetings and conversations between the current First Minister of the Scottish Government with the former First Minister of the Scottish Government about a Scottish Government investigation into allegations of sexual assault reportedly made by two Scottish Government civil servants. Why doesn't the First Minister think that the public has a right to know the basic facts of those discussions. First Minister. Well, I have just, on Tuesday and again today, I have just uh, told Parliament and by extension the public uh, what the, the subject matter uh, was of that. I still say the most important thing here, and this is a point that is absolutely self-evident that I did not intervene in this process in any uh, way. Uh, that uh, is, I think, the most important point. Now, on the question of, of wider inquiry, it is entirely for Parliament to decide it wants uh, an inquiry into all of this. Uh, as I said on Tuesday, as the Permanent Secretary said on Tuesday, the Government intends to review the aspect of the procedure that it applied in error, and that is something that Parliament will have an interest in, and of course Parliament has an interest in wider issues around this. So it's not for me to uh, say what Parliament should and shouldn't do, but obviously the Scottish Government, uh, myself, the Permanent Secretary, any other uh, member or official of the Scottish Government will cooperate fully with whatever Parliament decides to do. Richard Leonard. Presiding officer, if ministers meet external organisations or individuals, and find themselves discussing official business without an official present, for example, at a party conference or social occasion. Any significant content should be passed back to their private offices as soon as possible after the event, who should arrange for the basic facts of such meetings to be recorded. That's section 4.23 of the Scottish Ministerial Code. Can the First Minister explain if she's in breach of that code, or if she did place a record with the Permanent Secretary, will she publish it? First Minister. If there is a parliamentary inquiry, of course we will make all uh, appropriate information available. Um, I, I informed the Permanent... I've, I've just set out to Jackson Carlow when and what I informed the Permanent Secretary of, and we will make uh, available any information around that. Uh, I am 
satisfied that I uh, conducted myself appropriately in line with all of the, the rules and Parliament of course uh, will perform its uh, scrutiny role in the best way that it considers necessary. Richard Leonard. Presiding officer, on Tuesday the First Minister invited us to judge her decision to hold a series of meetings and discussions about these cases with Alex Salmond. First Minister, that was a grave error of judgment, but it was also a clear potential breach of the Ministerial Code of Conduct. After the events of this week, people need to have trust and confidence in the system. And that's why the First Minister herself should back a full parliamentary inquiry. And it's why she should refer herself today to the panel of independent advisers on the Scottish Ministerial Code. Can she commit to doing that? First Minister. Consider, I will consider any request that's made, in, including that one. On the question of whether I back an inquiry or not, I'm perfectly happy for Parliament to have an inquiry. The simple point I'm making is that it's not for me as First Minister to tell Parliament what it should and should not inquire into. So I will uh, make sure that if there is a parliamentary inquiry, uh, the Scottish Government, uh, all uh, aspects of the Scottish Government will cooperate fully with that. And for the next question, we have a couple of constituency supplementaries. The first from Alistair Allen. Presiding officer, the communities of Lewis and Harris recently commemorated the centenary of the loss of HMY Ayalair, which uh, on New Year's Day 1919 claimed the lives of 201 servicemen. The First Minister will be aware from her recent very welcome visit to Lewis of the deep feelings that this tragedy still evokes. Will the Scottish Government give its support to calls from the community for the Ministry of Defence to designate the site as a military maritime grave? First Minister. Well, can I thank Alistair Allen for raising uh, this issue, the commemoration for the loss of HMY Eyalair on the 1st of January. I attended that commemoration. It was very moving uh, and clearly the event is still keenly felt by the local community. Uh, the bodies of around one third of those who were lost in that tragedy were of course never recovered. So we are, I am supportive of calls to have the wreck of the Eyalair recognised as a war grave. Uh, members of the Scottish Commemorations Panel, which is appointed by the Scottish Government and others, have already raised this with the Ministry of Defence, with whom the decision uh, rests. But the Scottish Government uh, will continue to be supportive of that call. James Kelly. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Uh, it was reported last week that patients at the Queen Elizabeth University Hospital in Glasgow uh, were unable to wash because of a lack of fresh linen. There were also patients waiting surgery, having to sleep in dirty linen. This is completely unacceptable and a demonstration of the crisis in the NHS. Will the First Minister apologise to the patients affected and set out what immediate action the government will take to ensure that this disgraceful episode does not happen again. First Minister. Well, I understand uh, from Glasgow Health Board that laundry supplies uh, were affected by a particularly busy period over the new year, but I understand the board has uh, apologised already. I would certainly echo that and given assurances that the issue has been resolved. I understand uh, that the issue was uh, quickly resolved, but these uh, issues, of course, shouldn't happen and I would expect the board to uh, learn and apply any lessons from it. And John Scott. Uh, thank you, uh, Presiding Officer. First Minister will be aware that it appears that Hurston's in air is scheduled to close on the 16th of February. While my primary concern is for the future of the 81 staff involved, I'm also concerned about the loss of this long established iconic store in air. While I'm aware that the government teams have already met with Hurston's staff, can I ask the First Minister if there's anything further that can be done to help both and protect the future of the staff and the business itself? First Minister. Well, I'm also concerned to uh, hear about this news. Hurston's in air, uh, given my uh, upbringing in air, is a, a store I, I personally uh, knew well when I was uh, much younger uh, than I am uh, today. So, you know, clearly this is not only a blow to the staff concerned, uh, given the longevity of that store in air, it's a blow to the town as well. The Scottish Government will, as we always do in these situations, 
uh, liaise with uh, the employer to see whether there's anything that can be done to help. And if, uh, unfortunately, uh, the closure cannot be averted, we will make sure through the PACE initiative that appropriate support is provided to staff. I'm sure this will raise uh, wider issues about uh, regeneration in air, which, of course, the government would also uh, be happy to be involved in. And Monica Lennon. Thank you. In this chamber at the end of November, I raised the plight of six-year-old Cole Thompson from East Kilbride with the Health Secretary. Cole has debilitating epilepsy and medicinal cannabis could save and transform his life. I'm grateful to the Cabinet Secretary for meeting Cole's mum, Lisa Quarrell, last month. However, I have learned that Epidiolex is being rationed to only a handful of children in Scotland and that Cole is on a very long waiting list. In a letter to Lisa, Jean Freeman said that specialist centres in Glasgow and Edinburgh will each be limited to applying for treatment for five children. Lisa has now secured medicinal cannabis privately in Spain, but at significant financial costs. Will the First Minister do everything she can to help Cole and other children like him who are suffering in Scotland to receive the medicine and treatment they need from our NHS? First Minister. Well, can I again express my uh, thoughts for uh, this family? I mean, watching any loved one suffer is absolutely heartbreaking, and that's even more so when it's a child. So uh, we take uh, these calls from families uh, very seriously. I know Monica Lennon knows uh, the position in terms of uh, medicinal cannabis and the, the fact that this is an unlicensed in uh, the UK medicine. The, the manufacturer, I know, has applied for a licence on which the European Medicines Agency are expected to make a decision earlier this year. Um, in light of Monica Lennon's uh, latest question, I'll ask Jean Freeman to look again at the issue of uh, coal in particular to see whether there is any more that the Scottish Government can reasonably do to help in his particular situation. Question number three, Patrick Harvey. Thank you. Like MSPs across the chamber, I've been hearing from colleagues and constituents from around the country about the cuts local councils are now having to contemplate and the devastating impact if they're forced down that road. I'd like to tell the First Minister about one disturbing example. Ryan is five years old, lives in Falkirk and has severe autism. His mum wrote to explain that the family were happy when his nursery recommended sending him to a mainstream primary school because the support he needed was there. She said the first few weeks were challenging, but we were amazed at how his social interaction improved. He can now speak, he's very intelligent, and we're very proud to be his parents and want to thank the school for all their support. On Monday, my husband was pulled aside by his teacher who told us as of that day, Ryan's support has been slashed from two hours a day to two and a half hours per week. Presiding officer, this is a young boy whose condition means that he can't go to the toilet himself. And now, in order for him to remain in school, his parents will have to go into his class twice a day to change him while he's in school. Those two hours a day of support were essential in giving him a chance to benefit from his education and to flourish. Ryan's parents have been told clearly that the school can do nothing about this cut. Ryan's mum says, not only is this disappointing and stressful, we fear it will completely undo all the work that's been done to give Ryan a routine. God forbid he has a bowel movement in between the allocated changing times. The slash of hours affects all kids with support needs, not just our son. Does the First Minister think that this situation is remotely acceptable? First Minister. Well, the situation that Patrick Harvey uh, has described would not strike me as an acceptable one. I know how important it is for children uh, with special needs in mainstream education to have the appropriate support. Um, obviously, Patrick Harvey has given uh, a fair amount of detail there about the individual case, but I don't know all of the circumstances of uh, Ryan's individual case. I uh, will ask the Deputy First Minister uh, and Education Secretary to look at uh, that case and any wider issues uh, that it raises, and he'd be happy to correspond with Patrick Harvey when he's had the opportunity to do so. Patrick Harvey. I appreciate the, the offer to correspond. Now, I understand the First Minister doesn't know all of the individual details, but the First Minister does know that there are 500 fewer additional support need teachers in Scotland's schools in 2018 than there were in 2010, because we've been making that case, as have others across the spectrum, for, for a long time now, despite the more than doubling of the number of children with additional needs. This situation and others in other local services is only going to get worse if more cuts are forced on our councils. ASN and every other local service will suffer. 
and new ring fence funds for new policies imposed on councils will not make up for the cuts proposed to their core services. Now, since the SNP lost its majority, the Greens have been persistent in seeking positive changes to protect local services. But we don't demand the impossible. In fact, the government admits there's an extra £500 million in the coming year's budget because of the fairer tax plans we persuaded them to adopt last year. Why then should we saddle our councils with a staggering level of funding cuts which the First Minister knows will inevitably deny vulnerable pupils and so many other people in Scotland the support they need? First Minister. Well, before I come on to the budget point, let me just uh, return to the ESN point because it's an important issue. I mean, I had an exchange, I think, with Richard Leonard in the Chamber on this point a few weeks ago in terms of the overall numbers of staff in school uh, working with children uh, with ESN uh, has increased. Obviously, uh, teacher numbers generally uh, have increased in the last uh, couple of years, but I don't underestimate the pressures uh, that uh, are there when dealing with children with special needs of uh, this nature. Um, on the, the budget point, um, yeah, I'll say what I've said to Patrick Harvey and to others before. We put forward a draft budget. Patrick Harvey is right that there is a uh, resource available in that draft budget because of the tax decisions the government has taken. But we've allocated that resource. We've allocated that resource uh, to the National Health Service, to local authorities, for example, for the uh, rollout of the, the doubling of childcare. Now, the simple point I will make to Patrick Harvey and to others is if you want us to change the, uh, the judgments about allocations we've made in order to put more money into one area of the budget, then there also has to be a discussion about which area of the budget that money should come from. That part of the discussion cannot be allocated because what is not in the budget is £500 million of unallocated resource. Every penny uh, that we have available to us has been allocated. So I, obviously we want to have budget discussions. Uh, we're prepared to have those budget discussions across from parties across the chamber. But that has to be a discussion rooted in reality. Uh, we can't create money from nowhere. If more money is to go to one area of our budget, then we have to be honest about where we're taking that money from. Question number four, Willie Rennie. The Deputy First Minister, John Swinney, has repeatedly claimed there are many people who emphatically support his primary one national tests. We asked the government who these many people were. It turns out there were just two of them. One was Professor Dylan William, an education advisor to Education Scotland. But he said John Swinney's claim that he emphatically argued for the government's tests was a substantial and perverse misrepresentation of his work. And that the person who made this claim was too stupid to be doing that job or deliberately misleading. Can the First Minister tell us, was John Swinney deliberately misleading or is he too stupid to do that job? Uh, well, yes, I let me address the, the substance of, of the issue. The Scottish Government referenced Professor uh, Williams' work because we, we interpreted his research as being supportive of a formative approach to assessment. If that's not the case, we are happy to recognise that. It was not our intention to imply that he supported the specifics of the Scottish National Standardised Assessments. But it is the Scottish Government's view that in line with best practice internationally, the assessments provide formative diagnostic information to teachers on aspects of literacy and numeracy, and that that information is then important in allowing teachers to ensure that uh, their judgments uh, are allowing the right support to get to uh, pupils in the right way. And all of that is crucial to our objective of raising attainment and closing the attainment gap. And before the second question, before, Mr. Rennie, before the second question, the first question was on the borderline of what's acceptable. And so just be careful about insulting other members of the Parliament, Mr. Rennie. Officer, these were the professor's words. But not Mr. Mine. Rennie turned it. Mr. Rennie, Mr. Rennie quoted they, the Mr. Rennie quoted the professor and then tried to turn it into a stroke, a clever question, but or almost an insult. And I will not accept other members being insulted in this chamber. So just be careful about how you word your next question, Mr. Rennie. The First Minister is absolutely wrong. We asked John Swinney's office for the names of the academics who support P1 tests. 
The professor's name was supplied. The professor is now owed an apology. And so is Professor W. James Popham, the second name on the list. He said the claim, whether made from ignorance or malevolence, is flat out incorrect. She must apologise for insulting this global expert as well. Teachers are against the test. The EIS opposed the test. Councils are ditching the test. Parliament voted against the test. And now the minister's preferred experts think his tests are useless. Ignorant, useless, malevolent, stupid, misleading. Will the First Minister finally dump these tests? First Minister. Well, in terms of the, the professors, uh, their work was uh, cited as we believed it was uh, evidence of support for formative assessments. If we got that wrong, then of course we apologise to uh, the professors for that. We did not say they specifically supported uh, the Scottish National Standardised Assessments. Um, I believe the assessments are important. It's uh, important uh, to have uh, something that allows teachers to moderate their own judgments. Teacher judgment remains uh, the definitive uh, assessment uh, tool in our schools. Uh, I think it is important that we are able to know which pupils are doing well, which pupils need stretch, which pupils uh, need extra help. On the, uh, finally, on the issue of councils withdrawing from uh, assessments, uh, that's actually not the case because councils uh, who are withdrawing from the standardised assessments uh, that we have put in place are going back to old assessments and in some cases, uh, in the case of Fife for example, uh, they are going back to doing uh, two assessments uh, a year instead of one assessment and they're using a system of assessment that is not aligned to curriculum for excellence. So, you know, I do think it's important to be, uh, you know, clear about that. So we will continue uh, to support an approach in our schools that allows us to get the right support to pupils and help close the attainment gap. We have some further supplementaries. The first from Shona Robison. On Monday, the First Minister announced £10 million for the Tayside Industrial Strategy, which is, of course, welcome. But can the First Minister reconfirm and reiterate the previous Scottish Government commitment made that Mitchellin and my constituency will receive resources beyond those already allocated in the Tay Cities deal in order to repurpose the site and create a true economic legacy for the Mitchellin workforce? And will she also undertake to further press the UK Government into stepping up to the plate to also help fund a Michelin legacy, given that they've already shortchanged the Tay City Steel by £50 million. First Minister. Well, can I thank Shona Robinson for the question? Uh, the Scottish Government has been clear all along that we were prepared to invest £200 million into the Tay Cities region and we've delivered on that promise. I remain, like Shona Robinson, disappointed that the UK Government has chosen not to match that scale of ambition and I hope even now that it changes its mind. Uh, the, 10 million, uh, I, uh, the 50 million I announced uh, on Monday uh, will include 10 million for the needs of manufacturing uh, businesses across the region and I'm sure that future uh, options for the Michelin plant in Dundee will be a key focus of the discussions with regional partners as they work with us to shape the industrial investment <coughs> programme. Uh, however, we're absolutely clear that we will provide uh, also additional support to deliver on the MOU signed with Michelin uh, in December. And as a member of the Michelin Action Group, I would hope and expect the UK government to do likewise. Jenny Mara. I am disappointed, First Minister, that this week you had £50 million to allocate to our region and following the closure of Michelin, you only managed to find £10 million for any industrial uh, development in Dundee. I would have expected, and many people in Dundee would have expected, that full share of the £50 million to come to our city. But as a result of her budget, jobs are under threat in Dundee. Compulsory redundancies have been mooted by SNP councillors in Dundee. Now we all know that the First Minister has a policy of no compulsory redundancies. Will she confirm this policy today and guarantee that there will be no compulsory redundancies in Dundee City Council while she is First Minister? First Minister. Well, of course, as I'm uh, frequently reminded by members across this chamber, uh, councils are autonomous and they take their own decisions. The Scottish Government's no compulsory redundancy policy uh, remains in place. I don't think, if memory serves me correctly, there was any such policy while Labour were last in administration in the Scottish Government. And as for, 
as for the start of Jenny Mara's question, I mean, it could only be a Labour MSP that stands up in this chamber and says, I'm furious that you announced £50 million of additional investment. What a pathetic response. £40 million is for transport infrastructure that will open investment across Tayside and £10 million to help with manufacturing, which will be important for Dundee as well as uh, for other parts of Tayside. There was a very warm welcome from all parts of Tayside yeah. from this uh, announcement on Monday, and I think it's really disappointing that Jenny Mary, Mara can't find it within herself to welcome it as well. Yeah. Ruth Maguire. Presiding officer, with fox hunting legislation set to be significantly strengthened in Scotland, what message does this send to those who might seek to flout the rules and how will this strengthen the hand of Police Scotland in tackling illegal hunts? First Minister. Well, uh, Mary Gijon, uh, of course, the Minister uh, responsible, set out our proposed uh, way forward on fox hunting yesterday. We're going to implement the majority of Lord Bonamy's recommendations also introduce a new limit of no more than two dogs to be used to find or flush foxes uh, hunting or chasing wild mammals including uh, foxes will continue to be against the law as it is uh, at present uh, we also intend to ensure that there are no loopholes that would allow hunting to continue so i think this sends an important message um, about animal welfare and the importance we attach to animal welfare and i I uh, hope the member and others will welcome that and obviously as with any strengthening of uh, the law um, and of course uh, this still requires to get the support of Parliament but as with any strengthening of the law uh, that gives options uh, to the police to make sure uh, that illegal activity doesn't take place. Neil Findlay. Um, the government acted at Mitchell and Dundee when problems were identified working with the company and the workforce uh, keeping employees informed of developments. Contrast that to Kayam at Livingston, where workers were kept in the dark, despite the government knowing about the company's problems a month before it went into administration. And this week, uh, we learned that the minister, Jamie Hepburn, did not even lift the phone to the company throughout the month-long period up to the closure. First Minister, do you think that's good enough? First Minister. Well, well firstly, can I uh, put on... Uh, record uh, my sympathy for the position that the Kayam workers uh, are in and uh, the support, any support the Scottish Government can give uh, to them uh, to find alternative employment or other support uh, will be provided. Um, I do think Neil Finlay misrepresents, uh, I'm not saying he's deliberately misrepresenting, but I think it's a mischaracterisation of the position of the Scottish Government. The Scottish Government will frequently uh, be given information that companies are in difficulty uh, or having cash flow problems or that their future is in jeopardy and principally through Scottish Enterprise uh, we will seek to support the company as I understand through Scottish Enterprise was the case uh, here to try to find an alternative buyer to try to find ways of uh, solving uh, any cash flow issues getting investment into companies in this case in some cases that will prove successful in many cases that people will never hear about it's because that kind of uh, work proves successful in some cases regrettably uh, this can't be the case and that was the case here it's not when efforts to save a company are ongoing it's not for the Scottish Government uh, to tell uh, employees that's a, a matter for uh, companies and it's not for the Scottish Government to do anything that would undermine the efforts of a company uh, to find alternative ways forward so we will continue as I think to be fair Neil Finlay recognises uh, in the case of Michelin and um, in the case of other companies where we can make an intervention to save a company from closure we will do that but we're not going to uh, pretend that that is always possible because it's not always possible to do unfortunately and Gil Patterson hey, many thanks presiding officer first minister we're, we're within 80 days of a potential disaster of a no deal Brexit what we've seen this week lorries parked in an airfield and a ferry contract awarded to a company with no ferries does not instill any confidence in the, the gen general population. Does the First Minister think these preparations are adequate? What share of resources is Scotland receiving to help our country to prepare? And can Scotland look to establish a better direct link with Europe ourselves by sea and air to counter the damage of Brexit? First Minister. Well, firstly, a no deal Brexit, as everybody knows, will be uh, catastrophic. But let's be plain about it. 
any Brexit is going to be bad for Scotland. And of course, Scotland voted against Brexit. The Prime Minister's deal uh, is bad uh, for Scotland. It's bad for the UK, which is why it looks like a majority of uh, people in the House of Commons uh, will vote against it. So in response to uh, Gil Patterson, of course, we've got to, in the Scottish Government, look at all contingency options, including uh, looking at how Scottish companies and different sectors of the economy uh, can get uh, the, their products to market. And we will continue to do that. But, you know, fundamentally here, uh, there is uh, an issue that uh, for people in Scotland, I think, becomes ever clearer. Until in Scotland we are in charge uh, of our own destiny, able to make these decisions ourselves by being an independent country, then we will always be at the mercy of damaging Westminster decisions. So the sooner, in that respect, Scotland decides to become independent, the better. Question number five, Keith Brown. To ask the First Minister what the Scottish Government's response is to reports that the UK Government plans to halt the full rollout of universal credit. First Minister. Well, the uh, Amber Rudd's uh, announcement of uh, a pilot for managed migration, of course, doesn't change the reality of those already suffering uh, under universal credit uh, because previous calls to halt the rollout were completely ignored, uh, nor will that announcement uh, stop an estimated 1.6 million people across the UK naturally uh, migrating to universal credit due to change circumstances ahead of uh, full migration uh, from 2020. So I take the view, as I have done previously, I still take the view that there should be a complete halt to universal credit in order uh, that fundamental changes are made because people are suffering People are being driven into poverty and debt because of universal credit, and it is completely and utterly unacceptable. Keith Brown. Can I thank the First Minister for her response and advise that my constituency of club manager in Dunblane was unfortunate enough to be at the vanguard of universal credit, which for Scotland, in many respects, is reminiscent of Thatcher's poll tax. Mm -hmm. Despite the hardship and damage that it's caused and continues to cause to many of my constituents, and despite the fact that Conservative members in this chamber have ignored, denied and downplayed its effects, I am hugely disappointed that the UK Government planned to proceed with their managed migration without any changes to the current deeply flawed system which has already forced many thousands into poverty. Does the First Minister agree that the UK Government must, must listen to the calls of so many people, including the UN, to fix this failing policy? And will her Government raise this with the Working Pension Secretary? And does she agree that the full powers of the welfare system should be devolved to Scotland? Yeah. First Minister. Yes, I agree wholeheartedly with that. Uh, Keith Brown uh, talked about universal credit being reminiscent of Thatcher's poll tax. I think, I hope I'm not... Uh, misquoting him here, but I think John Major, you know, former Tory Prime Minister, has also described universal credit as being uh, like uh, the poll tax. So it is time for the UK government to listen to the overwhelming evidence of the failings of universal credit, uh, which the UN Special Rapporteur on Poverty recently described as universal discredit. Uh, the UK government should make fundamental changes uh, to make it fit for purpose and halt it in the meantime. Uh, the Scottish Government has repeatedly raised these failings uh, with a succession of working pension secretaries and we will continue to do so. But as I've said in this chamber before, I'd far rather be in a position uh, of rather than just having to plead with a DWP uh, minister in Westminster that this parliament had full powers uh, over uh, universal credit and the wider social security system um, so that we could take our own decisions. Another uh, reason why this country should sooner rather than later become independent. And question number six, Jamie Green. Uh, to ask the First Minister what action the Scottish Government is taking to tackle anti-Semitism. First Minister. Well, the Scottish Government, uh, in common, I hope, with everybody across the Chamber, is committed to tackling hate crime and prejudice. And I want to uh, reassure Scotland's Jewish communities that there is no place in Scotland for any form of anti-Semitism or religious hatred. Uh, we value uh, our Jewish communities. We value the contribution uh, they make to Scotland. Uh, and I think that's a message that should go out strongly uh, from this Chamber. As well as our ambitious programme of work to tackle hate crime and build community cohesion, uh, we've also adopted the International Holocaust Remembrance Alliance's definition of anti-Semitism. Uh, this sends a strong message that we believe anti-Semitism to be entirely unacceptable in Scotland. Jamie Green. Yeah, can I thank the First Minister for that response? But the First Minister will, will be aware of recent press reporting comments made by Ephraim Borowski, uh, Director of the Scottish Council of Jewish Communities, in this very Parliament. Uh, may I quote from him? Mostly, 
the Jewish community used to feel that Scotland was a good place to be Jewish, but for many that has reversed. Many Jews actively discuss leaving Scotland because they feel alienated, vulnerable, and not at home. Presiding officer, I hope the First Minister is as worried and saddened by that assertion as these benches are. So can I ask her what guidance has been issued specifically to Police Scotland to address the scourge of anti-Semitism in Scotland? And will she join me in calling for all political parties represented in this parliament to do everything in their power to make sure that no one in the Jewish community should feel vulnerable or unwelcome in Scotland? First person. Well, yes, I, I will encourage all parties to do uh, exactly as Jamie Green has called for there. In terms of the police, I, I believe uh, the police have a good relationship with the Jewish community and work very closely with the Jewish community um, around uh, tackling anti-Semitism and also addressing the concerns of the Jewish community around uh, security. Um, in terms of Ephraim uh, Broski's comments, I've got huge respect for Ephraim and the work that he does. I've discussed this issue with him personally uh, in the past. Uh, I think and I'm, you know, he, he is more than capable of speaking for himself, but I, I don't think there was any uh, suggestion that the very legitimate concerns he raised uh, at the weekend uh, were in any way unique to Scotland. I think he was reflecting uh, a feeling of the Jewish community across uh, the whole of the UK, including Scotland, um, but also reflecting uh, an apparent rise in anti-Semitism, not just across the UK, but further afield. And I think all of us have to be very vigilant about that. Uh, and my responsibility is to make sure that that is the case, particularly in Scotland. And as I say, I've had discussions and will continue to have discussions uh, with the Jewish community about exactly that. I uh, made this point when I spoke at the reception in this parliament uh, earlier this week of the Holocaust Educational Trust. Um, and I will say this again here. The Jewish community is a valuable, vital uh, part of our society in Scotland. And if one member of that community feels unsafe here, then all of us have a duty to respond to that and to do everything possible to change that. And that's a responsibility I take uh, very seriously for the Jewish community and for any other minority community living in our diverse country. And I hope that's something all members will agree with and uh, echo. Thank you very much. And that concludes First Minister's questions. We're going to move shortly to members' business in the name of Mark Griffin on Macmillan and Marie Curie support, but we'll have a short suspension to allow the Chamber and members to change seats and the gallery to clear a short suspension. <laughs>